two. Two centuries. So, last redemptive front of capitalism is the Green New Deal, then the sort of complete ideology, you know, it's idealistic insanity of an infinitely growing economy on a non growing planet can, can be appropriately dealt with. But, but the Green New Deal has really important elements of redistribution, and that's a simple narrative. Like, top 10%, four and a half trillion pounds in this country, it's about half our wealth. Saying to people, there's no reason why we can't distribute that, we have a democracy. So, you know, I think you can be upfront about what is. Thank you. Uh, can I take your, your point, please? On eco-side, um, I've got colleagues book, unfortunately, I haven't read the whole thing, so I'll be answering my question. But has eco-side, you're saying under the UN, eco-side is actually already a crime and a war. Has there ever been any action around that? And secondly, in terms of the campaign, how will governments support something when their, their collaboration with corporations and their reliance on corporate activity for, you know, for, the, for economic development or whatever is so close, how are governments going to support ecocide? Because unlike genocide, it's, it's very much linked into what states are doing and how they function. Yeah. So first question was, has it ever been actioned in war? And secondly, yeah. yeah. Um, I have to check, to be honest, about whether it's been used. Um, what I do know from Polly is that it's been largely preventative. So it's been, it's actually been reasonably successful in wartime. Because it was, it, it was brought in in the late 70s. Um, because state, state states were, yeah, yeah, and because yeah, they were scared that basically that was just going to expand and expand. Yeah. Um, so, but I can check and get back to you on, on the details of that. In terms of whether governments are going to support it um, because of how it affects business that they're reliant on, yeah, it's a big sell. It's, it's absolutely a big sell, and I'm, I wouldn't pretend for a moment that it's you know, an easy thing for them to put in place. Um, what we really feel is that this is not about stopping business. It's not about ending business. It's about ending the wrong parts of business. Um, and you know, I'm not an economist, but um, if you stop the most destructive practices because they're just unlawful, you know, it's too risky actually to invest in them. Um, then you've still got all of the capital. I'm not saying this doesn't solve every problem of our economy. It doesn't solve every problem in the world. But the capital that you do have. There is a much bigger incentive then for that to flow into sustainable energy, into green investments. And I appreciate there's lots of other things that need to happen to, you know, to reshape the economy. Um, but actually, yeah, there is an opportunity there. It's, it's funny, um, uh, with CFCs, I know it's a smaller example, but um, there was a lot of worrying from business that how are we going to survive doing this? Um, you know, without these chemicals we come to rely on in our products, well, actually, they gave them transition period, and business is creative. You know, I mean, look at the derivatives in the financial industry. You, if nothing else, they are they can be creative, um, and you know, and actually, there is a chance, there is a way that they can reshape things. I guess just one very quick. I know people have got questions. One very quick example from history: two hundred years ago, the slave trade, um, the kind of biggest natural resource, or one of the biggest natural resources of the time, if you like using people as slaves. Um, you know, the big argument against that then was that companies can't survive without them, right? Economic collapse, we're all going to lose our jobs, okay? You know, you're, you're dreaming. And actually, um, what won the day in the end was partly was ordinary people standing up and protesting in lots of ways, partly was politicians coming on board, partly was actually one business leader um, this guy Charles Grant, who was he was the chief executive of the East India Company, one of the biggest kind of multinationals of the time, and he turned around and, and he changed because what he saw everybody around him was saying in society was that actually the moral imperative has to trump the economic imperative. We can always find ways of doing business in a better way. So I'm not saying it comes easy, but it can come. Okay, I'm getting 